Yes, thank you very much. So very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sofia Monsalve Suarez. I am the Secretary General of FIAN International, which is a human rights organization working on the right to food and nutrition and connected rights. But today I've been invited to be your moderator, facilitator of our conversation um, as a um, member of the International Panel on Sustainable Food Systems. Um, so I'm an expert of IPES Food. So I'm very glad to be today with you. Um, on behalf of CGIR, uh, Farm Beta and Swiss Aid, let me welcome you to this side event, uh, which is gonna deal with innovations for climate-friendly food systems. And we aim to have a deep dive into digitalization and agroecology for resilience. So it's a very interesting approach. You know that we have been uh, discussing for several years in this house about uh, different innovation approaches to transform food systems. And at times we think that digitalization and agroecology may be actually uh, opposed, uh, uh, dif different approaches, and it is hard to reconcile them. So I think it's going to be an uh, interesting question uh, today in our panel to see whether is there a possibility to reconcile digitalization and agroecology or not, because they are uh, um, departing from very different uh, points of view in terms of actors, analysis of power, and how they want to change and transform food systems. So it's a very thrilling uh, question to start our panel today. Uh, we will have nine speakers, uh, so we will be able to um, shed light uh, on this question from very different perspectives. It's a very interesting mix of policymakers, of science uh, and research, and also uh, from uh, peasants and people on the ground doing uh, farming. So uh, we have interpretation in English and Spanish uh, for our uh, side event today. And I also wish to say that since we have so many speakers, I am gonna be very strict with time. So we will use this methodology of ringing the bell. When your time is up, uh, we, uh, you will hear the, the bell and you will have a couple of seconds to wrap up uh, your key messages. But unfortunately, we need to be very strict with time if we want to get through all these different perspectives and views. Okay, so we can start um, and let me welcome, we will uh, start with um, an inspiring uh, three first panelists um, which are pioneer, pioneering action, uh, more from a governmental perspective. So we are very honored to have uh, with us today uh, Ambassador Mario Arvelo. Uh, he is the permanent representative of the Dominican Republic uh, to the Rome-based agencies uh, in Rome. And he also serves as chair of the International Steering Committee of the UN Decade uh, of Family Farming. Uh, Ambassador Arvelo, uh, the floor is yours. You will have five minutes. Thank you, Sofia. I thought you had said uh, that I had five hours, but uh, I, will, I will just keep it to the five minutes. Uh, like Sofia said, I am here because I am a govern government representative. And so I am going to give you uh, some pointers from a political perspective. That is uh, the job that I have. I used to chair the CFS and the Committee on Agriculture, and now the, uh, like Sophia just said, the International Steering Committee on Family Farming. And agroecology is extremely important from a family farmer's perspective. We uh, talk about the four-fifths paradox, which means that four-fifths of all food that is produced in the world is the result of the work of family farmers. At the same time, four-fifths, that's 80%, of all the hungry people, and we're talking about 735 million nowadays, are family farmers and their children. So this is an intolerable paradox, and agroecology is one of the manners in which we must tackle this uh, paradox and resolve it. I would like to mention a number of actors that have been very active in this field. Uh, we will listen from um, Swiss Aid, uh, uh, SDC, uh, the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation. Uh, also, uh, the IPES Food, that's International Panel of Experts on Sustainable Food Systems. 
and a number of countries. I will not go one by one, but uh, organizations, WOCAT, that's the World Overview of Conservation Approaches and Technology, the CGIR, of course, the consortium of um, uh, research entities, uh, the breakthrough report from the COP26, the Glasgow Declaration linking agroecology with tourism, and the Dominican Republic is uh, one of the signatories through the uh, Pedernales Initiative. I wish I could speak uh, on that for several hours. Um, and, when, uh, and especially, I would like to mention, last but not least, the uh, Agroecology Coalition under Emile Frisson. Uh, th there's uh, better than 45 countries that have signed up, more than 120 organizations, and they mirror the CFS in terms of having government, civil society, private sector, international financial institutions, UN agencies, um, academia, and all of the other stakeholders. A lot, have been, a lot has been done, but uh, agroecology still needs financing. When I talk to ministers, what they say is that, well, food systems transformation in terms of agroecology, that requires uh, a, an injection of fresh funds, and that's very difficult. Uh, always, ministers will say that that's very difficult because they do not have the power of the purse. That's ministers of finance, ministers of, of economy, ministers uh, uh, in other uh, fields. Uh, FAO, of course, they're hosting us. Uh, they are, have been doing great work on agroecology. Also, IFAD through the ASAP and ASAP Plus initiatives. Uh, but the fact remains that many uh, non-decision makers are uh, unaware of what agroecology is. And they have a number of questions, and uh, hopefully I, I will not be doing that, but the panel will be able uh, to respond to those. Um, I could also say, I have so many notes, again, I could speak for a long time. Um, so what is agroecology? It is very difficult to bring new subjects and uh, new ideas, new approaches to intergovernmental organizations so, such as FAO, IFA, WFP, and all the others in the UN family. Because those who are not aware of what's going on, uh, of course, there is an establishment of um, agribusiness that see agroecological approaches as something suspect. And they are the ones who already have ties with policymakers. So when an agreed definition is not on the table, some of my colleagues would immediately raise up their flag and say, well, we do not know what you're talking about, and we need to deal with definitions that we all concur with. So FAO has been uh, able, uh, willing, and then able to bring everybody together, and I will be uh, finishing with the definition, because this is what frames all of our discussions on agroecology. Agroecology, I quote, is a scientific discipline, one, a set of practices, too, and a social movement. That's the third uh, leg. As a science, agroecology studies how different components of the agro-system interact. As a set of practices, it seeks sustainable farming systems that optimize and stabilize yields. As a social movement, it pursues multifunctional roles for agriculture, promotes social justice, nurtures identity and culture, uh -huh. and strengthens the economic viability of rural areas. Family farmers are the people who hold the tools for practicing agroecology. They are the real keepers of the knowledge and wisdom needed for this agenda. Therefore, family farmers around the world are the keys for producing food in an agroecological way. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Ambassador Arvelo, for this fantastic overview about different initiatives uh, to push forward agroecology and also for reminding us the work that FIO has done on that and the challenges uh, in terms of implementing that vision. Thank you very much. So the next speaker is uh, Madame Marie-Laure Cretas Corredor. And she is currently the head of the food systems section at the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation. Um, and this is, uh, this represents Switzerland, uh, SDC represents Switzerland in multilateral institutions, international organizations and network and engages in global policy dialogue 
uh, managing innovative projects related to sustainable food systems, food security and nutrition. Adam, you have the floor. Thanks a lot. Uh, very uh, good morning or good afternoon to everyone. Uh, the government of Switzerland has put food system transformation nationally, but also abroad as one of the main pillar of our sustainable development strategy 2030, which form actually the basis of our national pathway for food system transformation. We are promoting agroecology as one holistic approach in support of food system transformation and in particular in our international cooperation that I'm representing today. We do that at different levels, at the global level, mainly in a dialogue with our key multilateral and priority partner like IFAD and CGIR that are also on the panel. Very happy that one of the 34 initiative of CGIR is on agroecology and uh, having IFA doing a whole exercise of a stock take uh, last year on what is agroecology, how is it reflected in the program. We also bring agroecology in the different uh, international spaces around SDG, but also the whole Rio Convention processes. And that's something we discussed yesterday uh, in the interlinkages session of the CFS. We engage, as it was mentioned earlier, with the Coalition for Food System Transformation through Agroecology, uh, one of the two days uh, hosts of the session. We've been one of the founders of the coalition, and we're convinced that the collaboration among countries, but also among different types of, of stakeholders, is a strong lever to activate the trans transdisciplinary response required. It's about peer-to-peer -peer learning, joint evidence building, and mutual support. And I would like to take this opportunity to comment the formidable progress made by uh, many countries. Some of them are maybe online on here or here in the, in the room. It's, it's uh, Uganda, Tanzania, Mexico, Costa Rica, Laos or Vietnam, just to name a few, who have in their national framework uh, incorporating the value of agroecology. We do this work at global level. We do it also directly in the country where we are active. Uh, especially in Africa and Asia. And for instance, uh, with the African Union, we were one of the first donors to support uh, the African Union initiative on the promotion of ecological organic agriculture. It's already a few years ago, and we have more than hundreds of thousands of small-scale farmers that have started to implement a range of agroecological practices. Agroecology, as we all know, it's not only about production, it's also the link between production, producers, and consumption. And men, in many African cities, there is a growing demand for healthy food, and there is also this issue being recognized and taken in, uh, own, in national strategy to respond to this challenge. Just to explain how we work at the country level, food system is a kind of a concept. How do, we, how do you implement it and understand it? We think that uh, the food system approach needs concerted and coordinated action between different ministries, departments, research institutions, relevant food system actors from producer to consumer. The transformation is a whole of society task that requires engagement and effective participation of all actors within and across all sectors, leaving no one behind. Giving people agency to shape their food system is critical and Switzerland as such encouraged local and territorial approaches, supporting multi-stakeholder platform and partnership. And we think that local actors, including CSO and community-based group, have a unique understanding of the local context. So our side event today is a mix of agroecology, climate change, and digitalization. So I want to make the link also with this uh, last topic. How is it related? Uh, I think we have to make sure that technology development gets in sync with agroecological transformation. Uh, we all uh, recognize that uh, di digitalization is an important factor and a lever for the transformation, supporting the farmers, the connecting producer uh, to users, improving access to information, to finance, and transparency in the value chain. We uh, think that uh, technology and tools should combine different approaches, being top-down, bottom-up, or peer-to-peer -peer modes of communication, but definitely farmers must be recognized as co-creator of knowledge and not just the client of prepared information. There is a need for inclusive, effective digital advisory services that can reach and involve men, women, and youth, 
and technical and social innovation must definitely be combined. This is exactly what the Swiss-funded project AgriPath is uh, aiming to do. You will hear about it uh, later on on the panel. The Farm Better app makes available for its user sustainable land management solution offered in the VOCAT Global Database. This is another Swiss-supported organization. So in conclusion, um, we here at the CFS 51, we just had uh, the approval of the policy recommendation on data. So I think that the implementation of this recommendation will also contribute to further develop technology and capacity uh, while strengthening food security and nutrition data governance, governance framework. And digitalization that takes this recommendation into account has the potential to offer opportunities for an agroecological transformation of our food system. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. Yes, thank you very much uh, for this overview of what uh, the SDC is doing and supporting in terms of um, transformation of food systems. Um, I also think that the guidelines, uh, that the policy recommendations on, on data are extremely uh, innovative precisely because of what you said, recognizing the co-creation uh, of knowledge uh, from uh, farmers and peasants and indigenous peoples. So thank you very much for that. Now, our next speaker is Dr. Jonathan Mokshal. Um, he is a research scientist, uh, senior agricultural economist at the Alliance of Biodiversity and CIA 8, and co leads the work package three of the CHR CGIR research initiative on national policies and strategies. Dr. Mokshal, uh, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much. Um, continuing with that concept of the paradox, um, one thing we do know is that the agricultural sector is extremely important for the most vulnerable farmers, and particularly looking at a sector that is affected by the impact of climate change, and at the same time also contributing to global climate change. What we see is that these impacts are felt in different parts of the world, particularly in the global south. Next slide, please. And within the global south, one can think of, for example, the south, eastern part of Ghana where recent floods are affecting food system, or the Karamajan region uh, of Uganda, or the Sahel region, or think about the tribal areas within Odisha state, for example, in India. All these people are affected by the impact of climate change. And for this reason, in order to find a solution, it's important for us to have breakthrough technologies and approaches that is will be able to help us better deal with these problems. Next slide. So based on this, what we see is that as a result of our scientific work within the CG, and also together with the FCDO, we came out with the Breakthrough Agenda Report for which the agricultural component also contributes very significantly. And within this report, we do have four principles that can help us to measure progress. Based on these four principles, we have seven breakthrough technologies and approaches that are relevant for the agricultural sector and five pathways for achieving agricultural breakthrough. And further, five key recommendations for the agricultural sector for reducing emission. So if we start from the left-hand side of the slide, we have the four principles listed here. And within these four principles, we have reduced greenhouse gas emissions from food, sustainable increase in agricultural productivity and income, improved soil, water resources, and natural ecosystem. And the fourth one is improved adaptation and resilience to climate change, particularly for the most vulnerable producers. So based on this, we do have the seven key technology areas and approaches. So number one is to reduce emissions from fertilizer, alternative proteins, reduce food loss and waste, crop and livestock breeding, reduce methane emissions from livestock. And the last two, which is also the focal point of this discussion, is agroecology and other sustainable approaches, and then digital and climate services. And all the details are highlighted in these two reports that you see on the extreme right-hand side. Next slide. So getting into the main component with regards to 
agroecology, and other sustainable agricultural practices. The key fact is that with regards to agroecology and sustainable agricultural practices, we need to pack the two together within a bundle. And for this bundle to work together, the enabling environment with regards to policy, with regards to co-creation, knowledge management, reform policies and institutions need to be combined with the technologies with regards to climate services, for example, or digital forestry services, which are key in order for us to be able to deal with the effects of global climate change. So based on this two, next slide, we came out with five key pathways. And these five key pathways includes all the seven technologies that we highlighted. But for the seven technologies also, we do have agroecology and digital services as a combined force multiplier. Next slide, please. As a combined force multiplier in order for us to be able to achieve these five pathways. So pathway number one focuses on reduced unsustainable consumption. And within this, we believe that it's important to promote sustainable and healthy diets. And promoting sustainable and healthy diets is one way for us to reduce carbon, uh, carbon footprints. Next, we need to increase production and sustainable healthy diets and also produce food that is nutritious and healthy for all. And agroecological practices based on its diversified principles and including all other crops has a huge potential in order for us to be able to achieve this. And also crop breeding within new technologies, including them to deal with effects of climate change. Pathway number three, reduce damage to natural resources as water and also biodiversity. And then pathway number four emphasis on reduce emissions, either absolute with the aim of emission reduction across the entire value chain. And number five is to prioritize the needs and interest of smallholder producers. And within this also increase investment, for example, in social safety nets and agroecology and digital tools can increase access to modern technologies, information services. Next slide. So the five key recommendations for the break to achieve the breakthrough agenda are number one, it's important to embed an international collaborative action within all these domains. So number one is to focus on providing climate finance for proven technologies. So based on this, it's important to have increased investments incentives, both for the from the private and public sector, for technologies that have proven evidence of effectiveness. And agroecology and digital tools are two key areas. And also crop breeding. Number three is policies and regulations. And it's important to have long-term perspective in this context. Further, apart from this long-term perspective, the existing programs needs to be redirected or repurposed to support a move from business as usual to sustainability. Number three is to have metrics and indicators and standards for measuring our progress. And the four principles are very key for this measurement indicators. Number five is to increase investment in agricultural research and R&D development across the entire value chain. And finally, private sector and markets and trade will be key it's important to mobilize private sector investment and also look at business practices and best practices that promote international trade and engage consumers. Not last slide. So, Excuse me, Dr. Mokshal, your time is actually already up. Yes, <laughs> I'm, I'm done. Up. Yeah, Thank I'm you. done. So based on this, we want to thank um, all the artists from the CG and also SCDO for supporting this work. Over to you, moderator. So thank you so much. Applause. <laughs> Many thanks, Dr. Markshall, for sharing with us the key insights uh, of your very comprehensive report and for your recommendations uh, on the way forward. Well, so this was, we're through the first um, segment of our side event, where, which was about sharing the vision of um, governments and intergovernmental agencies, as well as uh, the uh, vision of science. 
Now we are moving uh, to the second segment, which is going to start um, from uh, the perspectives from the ground. And we will have first a video message from Doña Luz Marina uh, Ladino. She will, she's from Boyacá in Colombia. Uh, she belongs to the organization Las Mercedes. It's a women uh, farmers organization, and she will be presenting about the impacts of climate change uh, in her uh, territory. Right after her, we will hear from uh, Mauricio Garcia Alvarez. Uh, Mauricio is here with us. She, he coordinates uh, the SEEDS program, uh, SEEDS for Identity from Swiss Aid in Colombia. And he also leads uh, the work, uh, the networks that work in Colombia and are guardians uh, of SEEDS. And he also works in uh, education and formation process as well as participatory uh, action research. So first the video, and then we will hear from Mauricio. Buen día, mi nombre es Luz Marina Ladino Ciabato. Soy nacida acá en Mongui, en la vereda Santa Ana, sector Loyada de Mongui, Boyacá. Aquí venimos trabajando la agroecología limpia, trabajando también lo del monitoreo climático, por los cambios que hemos tenido tan bruscos en nuestra región. Eh, hace unos 30 años hacia atrás, eh, se sabía cuándo helaba, cuándo llovía, cuándo eran las nevadas, cuándo era verano. Ahorita, en todo el año, eh, en cualquier momento hiela, en cualquier momento neva. Ya no tenemos como ese punto físico de donde decíamos vamos a sembrar tal día, que era en enero. Después del 10 de enero se hacían las siembras, ahorita ya no se puede eh, confiarnos en eso, entonces hemos venido planeando y estudiando qué meses podemos sembrar, en qué tiempo podemos deshiervar, qué granos podemos sembrar o qué, eh, qué papa podemos sembrar en tales fechas. Eh, esto nos ha servido en la organización que estamos incluidas en la organización Las Mercedes, donde trabajamos mujeres rurales a estudiar y a trabajar nuestra tierra para trabajar nuestro propio alimento en, en nuestras huertas, en nuestras fincas, eh, cómo mejorar una calidad de comida, comida limpia, dejar ya los químicos a un lado, eh, variar eh, ensayando qué semillas se pueden intercambiar, traer y ponerla acá, porque antes no era sino la papa, el trigo, la cebada, el lava. Hoy en día ya podemos sembrar variedad de maíces, variedad de alberja, eh, variedad de hortaliza. Eh, ya con los invernaderos podemos sembrar también diferentes especies como tomate, habichuela, pepino. Entonces eso nos ha ayudado a mejorar nuestra calidad de vida, nuestra economía para nuestros hijos y nuestro hogar. Bueno, buenas tardes. Eh, bueno, como nos enseña la compañera Luz Marina Ladino, que vive en Boyacá, en un páramo, en el páramo de Osetá, en Boyacá. Eh, ese páramo es muy importante para ella, para todas estas comunidades que han vivido de la agricultura durante muchos años, pero a nivel nacional eh, los páramos son muy importantes porque son, eh, sirven para la regulación del ciclo hidrológico de más del 70% de la población en Colombia. Entonces, de allí depende gran parte del agua que tienen eh, las comunidades y el país en general. Eh, estos páramos que representan en Colombia el 50% de los páramos a nivel global, eh, tienen unos impactos muy grandes a nivel de la ganadería, de la minería, de los monocultivos y... Eh, lo que ha hecho el gobierno colombiano es impulsar unas leyes para delimitar las zonas de páramo y empezar a regular los actores que están afectando estas, estas zonas. 
Igualmente, eh, las comunidades tienen que irse adaptando no solamente al cambio climático, sino a estas regulaciones y a mirar cómo es que van a enfrentar los problemas actuales. Y por eso, pues lo que nos decía doña Luz Marina, se ha venido haciendo un trabajo de primero entender cuáles son las condiciones del clima que están cambiando, en términos de saber cuándo está corriéndose las lluvias, por eso estamos hablando de los calendarios agrícolas, cómo, cómo es que van cambiando, que, sea, que sean acordes a las fechas en que hay que sembrar o en que hay que cosechar. Se está trabajando en todo este tema de los invernaderos, de cómo cambiar sistemas de cultivo, ya sea ampliarlos o rotaciones, etc. Se está trabajando en los temas de recolección de aguas y, muy importante, todo lo que venimos haciendo con las redes de custodios y guardianes de semillas en la recuperación de semillas a nivel nacional, donde tenemos más de 20 redes eh, con las que estamos trabajando y que se están recuperando semillas de maíz, es más de 400 variedades, semillas de papa, más de 200 variedades y así en ese proceso eh, de recuperación de semillas que son adaptadas a las condiciones locales para eh, en el futuro tener semillas adaptadas a, al cambio climático. Además de estas situaciones o de estas propuestas que están desarrollando las comunidades en sus fincas, pues también tenemos que pensar en estrategias a nivel de la comunidad, del territorio y en esto es muy importante el, la planeación y el manejo de las cuencas. No es solamente pensar en la finca, sino en las cuencas, pensar en programas de aislamiento y conservación de fuentes hídricas, en el seguimiento y estudio del clima. Eh, ahí es donde venimos también utilizando algunas herramientas eh, como medidores de la lluvia, medidores de temperatura, eh, que se hace difícil cuando son manuales, porque todo el tiempo tendrían que estar ocupándose de esta actividad. Entonces, estamos pensando en cómo tener eh, unos equipos que puedan ser más automatizados. El tema de la conservación, recuperación y aumento de eh, insectos polinizadores que está en crisis actualmente y el intercambio y recuperación de conocimientos, eh, incluso sobre todo estas prácticas agrícolas de biopreparados y fertilizantes, etc. Es allí donde nosotros, con base en todo este trabajo que se ha hecho con las comunidades, en las fincas eh, y a nivel de, de las cuencas hidrográficas, que pensamos que hay que promover y escalar la agroecología, que la agroecología sigue siendo el camino eh, frente a toda la problemática del cambio climático y que esta debe incluir además la educación formal, la investigación participativa, los comités de sabedores, pensamos que es importante hacerlo desde la comunidad eh, y trabajar con la recuperación de las semillas nativas y criollas. Es importante trabajar en estos sistemas de monitoreo locales y alertas locales del clima. En el caso del páramo es muy importante saber cuándo van a haber heladas, porque cuando hay una helada pues se pierden todos los cultivos, entonces sería muy importante avanzar tecnológicamente en estos temas y por eso todas estas herramientas de ADLAPS eh, pueden ser muy importantes y necesarias, eh, ya eso nos va a hablar Benjamín eh, con la herramienta Far Better, y eh, lo otro es fortalecer los sistemas alimentarios locales. Eh, pensamos que eh, los circuitos cortos de comercialización son claves en todo este proceso y la zonificación de áreas agrícolas con características importantes frente a estos temas de cambio climático. Eh, ir zonificando yo creo que es muy importante para todos eh, a nivel eh, nacional. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Mauricio, for these uh, insights from the ground and these very interesting examples of peasant innovation and their own determined use uh, of the new technologies that respond to their needs. Good. So, our next speaker, I need to check whether she is 
online is Dr. Lucique Wasilva. Is she online? Lucique yes, Wasilva. I'm online. I'm oh, online. perfect, perfect. Welcome, welcome, Dr. Lucique Wasilva. Mm -hmm. Uh, she works uh, for Kenya Agricultural Livestock Research Organization called CALRO uh, as Director of Crop Systems. Um, she has research experience uh, of over 35 years and author and co-author several scientific articles, technical papers and publications with an emphasis in molecular plant pathology, horticulture, industrial and food crop product value chains. Yes. Dr. Wasilva, you have the floor, five minutes. When the bell rings, uh, your time will be over. Thank you very much. And please um, put on the camera if you can. Thank you. Yeah, I don't know why it has refused me to turn on the camera. It is, it is rejecting, cannot start video. I don't know why. Okay, don't worry. Maybe you can do it on your end. On this end, I can't do it. Okay, I'll just go ahead and give the presentation. Thanks very much for it. Or start my video. Oh, here we go. So you can see what I look like. No, it's still refusing. Um, um, thank you very much for inviting me to um, just add a little bit to these discussions. And um, when you look at in terms what we need to do in terms of changing our crop production systems, the climate has is forcing us to change. A lot has changed in the past two years, especially after COVID on what we're growing, what we're eating. What we typically eat is a lot of maize and uh, beans. But now we have to shift because we now need to plant more drought tolerant, or we have no choice but to plant these more drought tolerant crops. So what is happening, we're using different uh, tools to be able to do this. Um, Calro is spearheading a lot of digital um, uh, data products, providing information that are able to inform on what we're able to grow. For example, the demazing of Kenya. Now we're growing things like finger millet, sorghum, uh, that, and the different millets that have been grown. And this is now changing the kind of food we eat. Even Kenya now, uh, the new baby on the block is teff. So there's gonna be a, quite a bit of teff uh, consumption. And then also growing different vegetables and different fruits. So there's a big shift based on those crops that are climate smart. So we get this information uh, from CalRO databases like the Kenya Agriculture Observatory platform that tells us when it's going to rain because most of our farming is rain fed. And then to know what we can grow because now that all these new crops come in, the millet, uh, the, the different indigenous vegetables, the wild fruits, then we go to what we call our crop selector that when you put in your county and your sub-county, it's able to tell you which crops to grow. Once you know what to grow, you go to another mobile application and a Google Play Store that now tells you how do you grow these crops. And then there are even others from other people of where do you market them. And a lot of these um, technologies that we're promoting, we're even showing people how to consume them because you can grow finger millet. And if you don't know how to grow, then what is that? Then also providing them the number of varieties that are available to grow uh, these crops and then how to store them. So what we're doing now is translating climate information practices and putting all of that together in big databases and providing um, providing the, the, the farmers with information uh, that they are able to use to grow crops because they're now not new. We're just going back to our local foods or going back to our roots. And this one makes a big difference. Can we go to the next slide? So when you look at um, um, these new foods and the new production systems using ICTs to inform, using uh, uh, databases to inform the, on the kind of crops to grow, to even inform on how to prepare them. Now we look at these technologies and how they impact on women, girls particularly, and also the youth, and to see how we can best benefit them because now you're looking at technologies that need a bit more financial uh, finances to be able to deploy them. So to uh, encourage women and, 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 and girls with this information that can be gotten off of cell phones is of showing the kind of foods that they can grow and then uh, to show the type of foods that they can prepare. So to do this, we've been having a, a lot of food festivals. There's one in National Museums of Kenya held every year. This year there were two. We also have some at the county level. We need to have quite a number of them in, uh, 
Busia County, where there will be a competition as to which county or sub county has the most diverse foods and different ways of propagating them. But to be able to get these foods, we have to know where to get the seed and from and how to conserve that seed. So and then and then once we have the seed, then we're able to grow. So our conservation is through utilization. And this is another area that is really being promoted because at times people are looking even for finger millet and they can't get the seed. And you think that that's a common crop. But now we've devolved down to the county level and having the farmers produce these seeds for seedlings so that they are available. And to be able to do this, we're using different uh, channels, like they're uh, using uh, a lot of it was on, on WhatsApp, it's very popular. Uh, radio, the radio programs promoting these crops. TV, a little bit. We go a lot through faith-based organizations, um, particularly the Christian faith. And then we also have hard copies because many Kenyans are still analog. They still want to have a paper to be able to read. So there's a lot of promotion right now in terms of now going to work with what biodiversity we have. Kenya is extremely rich in biodiversity and trying to go back to our roots to now grow and consume these crops in our landscapes that are very hardy and uh, um, uh, very hardy. They are resilient, climate smart, and they are those that we used to grow before. So there's a big shift, even with maize. Although maize is not indigenous to Kenya, but people now want to grow the the, the colored maize, the ones that are high in, in vitamins. And they also tend to have a, a notion that these might not be GMOs, but that's just Kenyan. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Wasilwa. That was very interesting also to see the perspective uh, from a gender perspective, from, from access of women to these technologies and their needs uh, and what they are doing about uh, the, uh, saving their seeds um, and conserving them through use. Thank you so much. The next uh, speaker will um, bring the perspective of a practitioner, of an entrepreneur. So I'm very happy to introduce Benjamin Graub. Benjamin is the co-CEO of Farm Beta. Uh, he co-leads a team of 12 change makers uh, on the way to bring digital advice to ext extension agents and farmers in Kenya, uh, different countries of Asia and Latin America. So Mr. Graub, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're still awake. We're in this post-lunch uh, death zone, I think. So, uh, um, yeah, at least nobody's snoring yet. So I think we're still here. Uh, my name is Benjamin Graub, uh, and I'll, I'll jump right into it. I think we have no time to lose. We have lots of panelists, and I'd love to hear from you also. Um, but also, we have no time to lose as... Uh, Mario Arvelo was saying, you know, in terms of uh, the hungry and food security, we are not achieving our goals of zero hunger by 2030 as it looks right now. So there is really a huge challenge there. And as we saw in the video by Luz Maria, um, the climate is changing and that's really very strongly impacting farmers right now. Um, uh, growing seasons, rain seasons are changing, extreme weather events, and, and that leads to effects on the fields, in the pockets of farmers, and in the end on the, on the plates and, and tables of farmers. Um, as also we've heard, agroecology is a very promising approach. Uh, within the CFS, it's been um, you know, looked at by its own high-level panel of experts. Also, um, FAO, um, I was part of the team that helped organize that symposium back in 2014, so we really brought together a lot of research and practitioners that showed not only um, does it work, that, but that it is being implemented. Now, generally speaking, people say, well, uh, you know, it's much more knowledge intensive. You can't just use a one, two, three approach everywhere in the world. You need to adapt it to specific contexts. And that's often seen as a weakness of agroecology. But actually, when we talk about opportunities for technology, it's much more interesting than a conventional, very simplistic approach. Because of the technology we have now, we can look at what kind of um, tailored best practices maybe have worked with farmers in one area that are shared by these farmers that can work beyond. 
Um, that's also a bit the founding story of us at Farm Better. Um, we had worked while still at FAO, some of us, uh, on a tool to measure climate resilience. And when we went to farmers, we would, you know, work with them uh, in over 12 countries. And at the end of the assessment, you know, you'd see relatively to your neighbors, your climate resilience to floods is lower or it's higher to droughts or economically. And people would say, so what? So what do I do now? And we'd say, we don't know. But, you know, that was very unsatisfactory. And that's where we started saying, what, what kind of advice is there? How can we use technology to bring, um, to bring, uh, to empower farmers to increase their climate resilience? Uh, we're now working with over 5,000 farmers across the world. Um, we've done some internal research in Kenya that's very encouraging to see that actually the farmers we've worked with have increased their yields and increased their incomes uh, compared to farmers who haven't used the app. And that's very encouraging for us because that's where we want to go to really improve farmers' well-beings through sustainable agricultural um, advice. How do we do that? We work on two levels. On one level, there's an Android app um, where uh, extension agents, uh, people advising farmers who work maybe with an organization, they can organize and manage the farmers uh, they work with and communicate with them much better. So, you know, a lot of these um, extension agents we work with, they have hundreds or thousands of farmers that they're currently working with at once. Now, I know many people complain about the WhatsApp group of their children's schools, but now imagine you have 1,500 farmers on WhatsApp who are asking for your advice. The complexity just, it gets out of hand, right? Um, so that's what we help organize, and at the same time, through the WOCAT database, we, uh, we match um, extension agents or farmers location and bring tailored advice on sustainable land management from the WOCAT database to them. That's one level with the, with the app. The farmers themselves um, are actually fully integrated through WhatsApp if they use it. So they can use WhatsApp, they can send audio messages, they don't have to be able to write necessarily or can also get them back and that fully integrates with the extension agent's application. What are challenges we're maybe looking at and working on? Uh, Marie Lorqueta mentioned the AgriPath project. That's really looking where we work on, on trying to figure out what are the most effective pathways to reach farmers. You know, is it directly self-service? Is it hybrid through extension agents? Um, secondly, it's really around how can we uh, improve access of women to digital advice? Because even in the early research here, two things we've seen is on one hand, it really differs in Nepal uh, most uh, farmers we've worked with are actually women uh, because a lot of their husbands are working abroad. Most of them do have smartphones and they use Facebook Messenger flawlessly. Uh, while in India, what we're seeing is that if we want to work with women, we need to start creating uh, gender-specific digital spaces so that because of social norms, they're actually allowed to take part in certain activities. Uh, on the other hand, and that's the work you've seen on the video and Mauricio mentioned, we work with SwissAid in the Ad Labs project. Um, and there, it's really around the co-creation of knowledge. So the WOCAT database comes already from the ground up, but how can we empower farmers uh, to easily, through WhatsApp, share best practices that have worked for them in, in fighting climate change. So um, we're, we're doing that currently in Colombia and Ecuador, and SwissAid themselves also work with a tool called Macho Sauti um, in uh, Tanzania. I have one last point, I'll, I'll go a bit over time, sorry, but one last point around, you know, what, what are we looking at, what are interesting things that I think everybody's talking about. Um, right now, one key challenge we see is there's so much knowledge out there. We can even, you know, tailor it that you get the right play, the right kind of knowledge where you are, but the format often just doesn't work for farmers. So the texts are written by, you know, people who have studied and we get large PDFs or, or, or long texts. So we try to adapt that, but I think uh, artificial intelligence and large language models and being able to automatically turn text into audio files so people who can't read can access them and the other way around are key and that's something we're really exploring how can we use AI to make sure that farmers can actually come and with a chatbot maybe solve 80% of their issues so that the extension agents then can use their time for the 20% of the really complicated difficult issues in person in person or virtually I'll stop here Thanks for your attention.
Great, thank you very much, uh, Benjamin, for these very hands-on examples and, and, and practical experience, how you are going about to reconcile uh, digitalization and agroecology continues being, is, is, it, is it a dilemma, is it not, is it a paradox? So thank you for your ex insight into that. The next speaker is Mr. Rémy Clouset. He's advisor on agroecology of the director of the Plant Production and Protection Division in FIO. Uh, he is an official from the Ministry of Agriculture, uh, seconded from the government of France, and he actually uh, organized and was involved in the cycle of consultations around agroecology in FIO from 2015 and 19, and on all the work, the wealth of work that was um, developed there. So, Mr. Clouset, the floor is yours. Hello, so I'm happy to speak after Ben. As he said, he was also in the FO team when we work on agroecology. We did this, this great job, I think. <laughs> so, I will start with the good news uh, about data. Uh, as the first answer of, of the question you have is that. Um, Resilience, we can see that resilience is highly correlated with agroecology. So when we make the survey, we always find a, a really important correlation, meaning that supporting agroecology objectively enhances resilience of, and climate change resilience and vice versa. So I will first go, uh, can you, next slide please, to go uh, quickly on the background about the tool. So it's a digital tool, okay, the tool for agroecology performance evaluation with three objectives. The first objective is the objective about um, collecting evidence. So it's a member's country or FAO who has FAO to develop metrics to assess agroecology. And uh, in the consultation we made on agroecology, we were asked to measure, to make the case for agroecology. So going be beyond yield and beyond economic performance to show the multidimensional uh, importance of agroecology and to be able to advocate for agroecology. So this was the obje um, first objective, but you have also the objective of supporting agri agricultural transition of the, of the tool and also developing capacity of producers. It's important not to be extractive, but to have a tool to give feed immediate feedback to, to have an impact and to change the practices, as also we could see with, with Ben. Next slide, please. So just to give you a view about the tool, so the, the tool is now uh, developed in 54 countries and almost all, almost 7,000 farms. I say almost 7,000 because we have new data every day because it's a digital tool and new data are coming every day. So it's a tool who has a big impact uh, because also it's a tool who was co-created. It was a participatory long process with all the stakeholders. So the stakeholder made, made the tool there. So this, this is an important, important part of this, I think, of, of the success of this of beginning success, I would say, of this tool. So we have many, so it's, this tool was pilot tested for four years. It was validated in May, last, last, uh, in May this, this year. So now we have many new development to come. We were waiting for the validation uh, workshop. So we have a community of practices. We are more user-friendly user interface, more automated analysis, and more quicker feedback for users. So next slide, please. I just need to explain to you the content of the tool, but it's really super short. We have two frameworks. We have two steps. The first step is about the 10 elements of agroecology. So this, this, um, this is the way to characterize the agroecologicalness of the farm. And the second step is about measuring the multidimensional performance. So we have five dimensions, governance, economy, health and nutrition, society and culture, and environment. That's why we are measuring. So the first step is important on the 10 elements. So you, you have like diversity, co-creation of knowledge. It was, it was mentioned, synergy, efficiency, recycling, resilience, human and social value, culture and food tradition, responsible governance and circular and solidarity economy. I quote them because I will come back to, to them now for, for, to answer part of the question. So what are the data saying? So if we can go to the next slide. So, 
You have 15 countries of sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, I, I hide the name of the country because, to be clear with you, these this data are not representative of the country. It was project. So the data of the result of a project, of different projects, is a country. So I don't want to, to design the good and the, and the bad country. But it's quite interesting because you can see a lot of things. First, I can answer the question, we need to have a diagnostic. You know, it's not, you can't have a global answer how to develop agroecology, how to develop resilience. So you need to contextualize. So, but I will try to have an answer at global level uh, for the moment. So you have this, this, this set of uh, all, almost 6,000 farms in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, you have tendencies, as I say. So the main findings that you can see, the variability. There is a light, light variability oh, in red. In red, it's a, we consider in 70%. So CAET is a, the level of transition in agroecology. The more the, the CAET is, is the better is the transition. So this is characterization of agricultural transition. So the red line is, you over the red line, you really well transition in agroecology. So you can see no countries on the red line. So first thing, you have variability. And second thing, you, see you have a lot, a lot of work to do. So that's why you are here, I guess, for this transition. So the, the room improvement is important. The second thing is that we can see that um, you have some country who are in transition. Huh? I, can call, I can quote, it's not the country, the project, but in Kenya, Mali, and Mozambique, we are really, really interesting example. So they can provide good practices. So collaboration within countries for good practices is really important. You have country who are lagging behind, so I won't quote them because it's not the country, as I said. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and also inside a country, you can see you have a lot of variability. So one policy should be tailored and should be adapted to different contexts and different, different systems. So the second thing I want to say, you can look closer because this is global. Now, that's the result of the 10 elements I show you. Now you can go element by element to try to see what is the strength, what is the weakness. You have 10 elements. In the 10 elements, you have 36 indices to make the survey. So you can go in one, every indices. So you have 36 parameters you can check to see, oh, what could be better? So we won't do that now, but for the element, I can give you a few, a few examples. The third element was the, was the more transformative. We have, with all this data, we can see, and it's, it, it's interesting because it was mentioned, how the uh, resilience, I already mentioned it, the co-creation and sharing of knowledge, that's the one who has the highest correlation with agroecology. So we were mentioning this, I, I think it was, it was said, so I won't, be, I won't be long. And you saw, also we have circular and solitary economy. So it was mentioned by Mauricio, so local food system. We see this, this is our entry point, well, change, or game changer. So if we want to work on agroecology, these entry points are really important. It depends on different, different uh, where is it, but at this place, yes. So also the, the networks of producers and things are really important, but I'm, I must stop. So I want to conclude about the good, uh, good news again. So the next slide. Because I spoke only about the assessment of the 10 elements or level of transition, but the real, the real question is the performance. Is agroecology performing? So we have a lot of data on this, but it's not a topic, so I won't speak about this. <laughs> but for, I will give you an, an, an example with soil health. So with 6,000 farms, you can see a direct correlation between agroecology and soil health. So for climate change resilience, you have, you have an answer, for instance. Mm -hmm. So we have this data for the 10 criteria and more, more than 50 indicators. Uh, to, to show this. So, okay. thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Closet. That was uh, fascinating to see how we are advancing in terms of producing information, solid information, on the uh, different indicators and, and, and uh, the performance of agroecology. Good. Our next speaker is Dr. Yotsnapuri. Uh, she is the Associate Vice President uh, for Strategy and Knowledge Department at IFAD. She leads the organization's strategy work in IFAD key areas targeting agriculture, climate, gender, nutrition, youth, and social inclusion. So, Dr. Puri, the floor is yours. They never teach you these things when you're doing your PhD. Okay, thank you so much, Chair. Um, I thought that I actually I'm going to not use my slides because I think that um, 
One of the key things that's coming out from this panel is clearly uh, a recognition that agroecology is a key part of how we see um, overall um, transitions to sustainability. Um, so I'm going to talk about three things. One, agroecology and how we see it at IFAD. Second, how we, view, how we are thinking about digitalization, because that's the other topic. And then very quickly talk about some of the experiences, all in three minutes. So the first point is really with respect to um, seeing agroecology. As many speakers before me have said, there are key 10 principles that we are associating with agroecology, right? And the key thing is recognizing that it is context specific, that we really need to see as to how uh, agroecological principles with respect to coverage, soil health, participation, equity are translated on the ground. Participation and equity is a very big part of agroecology. When we looked at our portfolio, and this was last year, we found, and this was not because we had set um, our own targets, but it was incidental, but we found, because we work with smallholder farmers, we found two things. One, that agroecology is integrated in 60% of our portfolio. Right? So that's important. But the second part is that when we compare projects or investments that have agroecological components in them, and we compare them with those that do not have agroecological components, the first type of projects tend to do far better in terms of overall impact. Translate this then and look at our entire portfolio and we find that yes, we have been, as a consequence of building agroecology into our portfolio, been able to make a far greater impact on measurable resilience. On measurable resilience. And so if you wanted to come and speak to me, and I love the forest plots, I love forest plots when they are presented, but if you wanted to come and talk to me and really hear as to what we are finding with respect to our meta-analysis to understand the overall impact on resilience, we can show that yes, not only was the impact of our agroecological investments significant on resilience, but also that it was measurable and the diversion was very high, right? So it was making a positive impact. So that's one. I think the second thing is really understanding that because we are an IFI, an international financing institution, we also think that it's really important to bring responsible capital to agroecology. How do we bring capital to this? First, we make investments in what, are, what is called precision agriculture, and then an example of um, well, precision agriculture, which means essentially using sensors, ensuring that we are using satellite mapping for the kind of precision work that Ben spoke about, Mary Lord spoke about, the ambassador spoke about. So we're using precision agriculture to really be very, very precise in terms of what kinds of practices, soil mapping soil quality on the ground. But the second part of this is really important understanding how we're doing benefit sharing. You'll notice that one of the key principles of agroecology is ensuring that there is equity and participation on the ground. So while we can have coverage throughout the year, we can have 15 crops, we can have multiple cropping, which, which are all context specific, the key thing is recognizing equity and benefit sharing. Blockchain technologies are one example of how we are also ensuring benefit sharing. So in pilot, projects that we are supporting, both in Western Central Africa as well as in East Asia, what we are doing is using blockchain, which is distributed ledgers that are essentially ensuring that we can look at every stage of the value chain to understand what are the inputs, what is the overall value chain contribution by different actors, and to what extent is agroecological practice not just there in the production system, but also incorporated across the entire value chain so that we can ensure, for example, that there's no chemical fertilizer that is used. So that we can ensure, for example, that we are also able to repatriate some of the benefits. The third part of what I want to say today is other than precision agriculture, and other than, for example, using satellite technology, sensors, and of course blockchain, is how do, can we ensure that we are, are truly leading to a space where there is, a, um, there is benefit sharing? 
One of the ideas that we are working on with the Ministry of International Cooperation in Egypt, as well as many of our other donor partners, as well as foundations and organizations like BRAC, is to think of benefit sharing when you're truly contributing to increased resilience. In other evidence that we've looked at, and I'm also happy to share that, agroecological practices lead to, uh, sorry, Smallholder farmers are far more likely to use agroecological practices than large monocultural farms. So that gives us an advantage. But then to repatriate those benefits, and I'll leave you at a cliffhanger, we are thinking of what's called resilience credits. The idea that if you invest in resilience, you will get money or incentives for investing in resilience. And the idea of resilience credits does that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Puri. That was really comprehensive. How, what is the take of IFAT on bringing together agroecology and digitalization for resilience? So we are finally through our main list of speakers. Unfortunately, because of uh, technical problems, we started late, but I would like to open now to the audience for at least one or two questions maximum. Um, so you need to be quick, <laughs> because, so please. So, Shantru Mathur of IFAD. Let me try and break the ice here. Uh, this is such an exciting uh, session here, and very aptly located in the green room. Uh, but it's such a shame, really, that we don't have the room full of people listening to such a wonderful array of of uh, wisdom uh, and, 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 and all of what you said on this side is, 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 is truly wonderful and in, in many ways path breaking in development. Um, all I would say is uh, that there are so many sound bites out there that, that excite us for the future. Uh, one or two things that were mentioned were co-creation of knowledge. Uh, and if we are to actually scale this up from a few thousand farmers onto the millions of farmers, that we actually need to make that difference uh, in terms of mitigation, uh, climate change mitigation, for instance, or even adaptation, uh, then we would need to develop uh, other ap approaches to truly participatory uh, knowledge exchange and co-creation that was mentioned. We need capacity building, for instance, at the level of frontline researchers and extensionists, uh, where there is truly a, a dialogue uh, between farmers and, and researchers, because a lot of what we talked about is context specific. So where is that dimension of local knowledge feeding into the co-creation or, or a blending of knowledge systems, bringing the best of science to the service of, 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 the, of the farmers, but building on their own uh, uh, ingenuity, if you like. So we need a lot of capacity building at the NARS level, National Agricultural Research Systems, to also listen and not just you know, uh, do a one-way transfer of knowledge. There are many other such things that I would like to add to this wonderful, wonderful set of presentations, but congratulations to all of you. Yes. Thank you so much for that yeah. uh, comment. Well, um, I'm afraid I need to now give the floor to uh, the next speaker who is, who is going to close with reflections and next steps. Uh, so I'm happy to introduce to you Mrs. Rachel Lambert. She is team leader uh, of the Food and Agricultural Research Team at the Foreign Commonwealth and Development uh, Office in the UK, if I'm not wrong. I don't have that in my notes. I hope this is right. So I see her uh, nodding. So, Mrs. Lambert, uh, you have the floor, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks to the organizers for bringing together such a um, rich set of discussions and topics uh, and thoughtful inputs from all of the panelists. And I think some really practical pointers as well for 
how we need to take these issues forward. Um, I was going to just uh, touch briefly on a few a few um, thoughts that struck me around the topic, uh, but also then come back to um, the breakthrough agenda on agriculture and the report which Jonathan shared at the beginning of the session and how that links and makes a bridge with the uh, the COP um, later this year. Um, I think you know we know that the the agri food sector requires these huge transformative changes. Or, or breakthroughs if we're going to reduce emissions and ensure food and nutrition security, but without damaging the natural resources. Um, so we're asking a lot of our agriculture and food systems if we're going to get smallholders more climate resilient. And whilst that transition to net zero in other sectors like energy and transport is going to be largely driven by um, the adoption and rapid scaling of a small number of breakthrough technologies like solar or wind, there aren't single technological approaches or breakthroughs in agriculture. It's the sector's inherent diversity makes the approaches um, uh, for reducing emissions and for building long-term climate resilience so, so context specific. And we've heard, um, heard that from the panelists today. So we do need to develop multiple solutions. We need to bring them to scale with partners in different contexts if we're going to um, deliver on that mission of feeding people, um, growing population using less land as, as, as the climate um, um, uh, heats. And so we're talking about kind of bundles of innovation in practices and technologies. Um, and and uh, that needs really careful analysis of kind of the trade-offs and synergies, uh, and certainly a real focus on what works in those different, different contexts. And today we've kind of focused in on two of those um, innovation areas. And I think it was really uh, good to hear the discussion at the end, kind of uh, showing that these aren't incompatible. They're not fighting against each other, but they can work together. I think a few key points coming out for me, um, you know, I think the evidence base is still relatively thin in these areas regarding what works. And that's why we need to invest in understanding better what works in different contexts focusing on those performance measures uh, and bringing and sharing that evidence. Um, we need to tailor to local conditions and we heard that digital and AI is opening up new possibilities to do that around making uh, advice more specific, more context relevant. Um, as we heard, it can act as a force, force multiplier. And we heard um, very practical experiences using machine learning and blockchain and, and other technologies and how can that help us in that work. I think that there's a lot more work needs to be done to bring governments and policymakers into the conversation on how we, how we, how we scale adoption um, and how we manage these innovation bundles. And we heard at the end there uh, about the importance of innovative finance and thinking creatively about how we can draw in finance from different, different uh, sources uh, and how we can get that to smallholders. And so really interesting to hear that point on resilience credits that DFAD shared. And then we've heard a really strong focus on equity and benefit sharing, the need for more inclusive approaches for co-creation, not just with farmers, but with players along the value chain. And it's that kind of, it's not just capacity building, but it's capacity sharing that we're, we're talking about. Um, so coming on to the agriculture breakthrough agenda, this is part of an, uh, uh, um, uh, an initiative, the Breakthrough Agenda, which was launched at COP26 as a political commitment to make clean technologies affordable and accessible for all by 2030. It covers several sectors and agriculture is just one of those, uh, but uh, we have 17 countries who are behind the Breakthrough Agenda in agriculture and we hope to grow that uh, number. The Breakthrough Report, which was published uh, this year for 2023, shows that despite some progress in some areas, we're still not yet delivering the levels of investment and deployment that we need to meet our international climate goals. And it calls on us all to turbocharge and strengthen international collaboration to support those actions at a national level. Um, so the next steps from the report that Jonathan shared at the beginning of this session, um, the 17 countries are coming together to develop a concrete and ambitious plan to improve international cooperation in this area. And that will be announced at the COP. And we encourage you to join us uh, in that event in the Food and Agriculture Pavilion that 
being organized by the CGIAR with the World Bank, uh, with the Just Rural Transition and others. Uh, and we'd encourage um, other countries to, to join us in that effort. Uh, and we'd encourage uh, you all to engage with that report and that, that um, plan process. Um, we'll also be using in the UK uh, the Global Food Security Summit, which we're hosting on the 20th of November in London. As part of that um, kind of set of milestones, if you like, between the CFS and where we are now and the COP. Um, and, and that will be another opportunity for us really to focus international attention on, on food, uh, the food security crisis, uh, and how we can uh, bring our investments together uh, really to make progress on, on sort of food systems transformation. Um, so I'll stop it there. I think it's been a, a fantastic and really rich uh, discussion. Uh, and I'll pass over to, to back to the chair just for final words. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Lambert. It's uh, really quite interesting to see that yeah, now all these insights and discussions are going to be taken forward to the COP28. Well, I think we have reached the end of our session today. Um, from my side, I think that it is really interesting that, uh, to see that we are moving in this discussion. And perhaps my last message would be to, we need to start tackling the issue of power in the governance of digital technologies and other technologies, uh, because it's extremely important to protect the rights of peasants and indigenous people's rights, for instance, to free prior and informed consent uh, in using these technologies. And I think that this is the challenge ahead. You saw in the negotiation of the policy recommendations here in the CFS that the governance issue of these technologies continues being uh, the most difficult issue to tackle. But if we, uh, as we said, if it is about knowledge co-construction, we need to ensure that the knowledge of peasants and indigenous peoples is protected. So thank you very much to uh, all participants, all speakers. I think it was really a truly interesting section. And thank you so much to the interpreters who uh, were uh, with us today. And uh, again, to the organizers uh, for putting together this exciting side event. I wish you a very good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.